Shooters Connection offers products for competition shooters by competition shooters. With over 80 years of combined competition shooting experience, Shooters Connection is staffed by master and grandmaster shooters who live the shooting sports every day. Every day. We offer same-day shipping. Shooters Connection also sponsors over 100 of your matches every single year. So when it comes to finding everything you need to compete as a beginner or a seasoned grandmaster, Shooters Connection is the only name you need to know. Online at ShootersConnectionStore.com. I'll do my part. I'll do my part. Hey everybody, it's the Hit Factor. We got uh, two-man crew currently. Uh, Sasquatch is, I don't know. He was, he was late. He's supposed to pop in. We'll see, we'll see what happens. But, uh, we're back here tonight. Going to be probably hitting some listener questions and talking about, um, me wanting to go back to single stack. We'll probably touch on that. Um, anyway, so as, as you most likely heard just at the beginning of the show, uh, this show today is sponsored by Shooters Connection. So, Hit up the link in the bio to support the podcast, support Shooters Connection. Much appreciated. Also, hit up social media pages as far as Instagram, Facebook. And if you want to join the Discord, there will be a link in the show notes description box below. So, thank you for joining us. We should have a decent show. I got a question for everybody. Like, So, at this point... Um... Oftentimes I open up the show. <laughs> why? Um, why you gotta do this? And then this was Jeff's. This was I don't know why. I don't know why. Like Jeff always makes me do it. And then we like Jeff's like, oh, I'll, I'll do it. And so I'm great. You open up the show. And so that was like Jeff bringing the fire and the energy there, which is looked about like his reload video. <laughs> Sounded about like his reload video. Every dude, every uh, time I like come in with some something subpar you name the topic jeremy's like all right okay let's just talk about how subpar that was no i want no i want to hear from i want to hear from everybody else like who they think like who they like like to do the show intro like who's who does that better because they might like jeff i mean i actually think i mean majority of people like jeff the best like he's probably the most popular person on the show uh and Mm. then Mm. and then there's not really a like for like me or sasquatch after that it's like well they're there so we have to listen Mm. to them we should put a poll out like if you could kick one person off the podcast who would it be (laughs) (laughs) that's what we should do that'd be and it's and it's so it's a revolving door. Like if if we kick somebody off, then then we add somebody, and so then it then it really becomes like the people's podcast because they get a oh, say man. in like who's that in would it. be super interesting and, to have like the people's podcast. So it's like, you know, like every yeah. quarter, let's say every quarter, like they could vote somebody off and vote somebody on. Wow, I yeah. actually really like that. Like have like a pool of of like six candidates. It'd be kind of neat if we if we could find some more people that'd yeah. be willing to talk to us once a week about uh, shooting. Oh, I was I was hoping then, to get voted off, yeah, honestly. Be, it, well, <laughs> yeah, no, you well you might get voted <laughs> off, but you still have to do the uploading and oh. putting it all on the on the Podbean and all that yeah. stuff. So you can't get away from it. You're kind of you're kind of oh. screwed. So. Uh, so the other thing that happened is Jeff like opened up a huge can of worms on the Discord today because uh, he he made a post mm-hmm. about that he wants to come up with a ranking system for USPSA. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about that. Like, w- what's your motivation for that? And then, like, this is a hundred percent like brainstorming at this point. Like, it's just like floating around Jeff's mind. I'm pretty sure there's no been like zero legwork at this point into actually doing there it, there has been a little leg like work as far as me like researching uh ranking systems and algorithms a little bit uh, so okay. i have done yeah. a little bit of research um but yeah so we've talked about this topic a little bit before uh, as far as mm-hmm. Uh, trying to you know fix classifier system if you think it needs fixing whatever or having a better ranking system um But anyway, so it's just something always in the back of my mind. Really, this this doesn't come from a place of like, I want to fix anything, right? Uh, This comes from a place of, 
I actually need a pet project to like, uh, this is completely unrelated, but it is related. Um, so I'm like pursuing kind of like a, a data analyst role at my, at my job. And so I'm doing like some courses, I'm learning some programming, all that stuff. Well, I need a pet project. I need a pet project where I manage a bunch of data and I write a program and I need a challenge and something to work on. So I was like, this will be awesome. I want to do this. So I threw it in there and that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about like the, the whole coming up with a way to rank it is like a quarter of the battle for me. Like I, I have, I have yeah. so much that I need to figure out and learn how to do that. But I love doing that stuff. I love learning and learning new things and figuring stuff out. So that's kind of where this is coming from. I just need a project and I thought this would be a fun one. So in the end, I would hope to have like, you know, you know, some sort of um, web address or, or website, you know, people go to and look at look at rankings, current rankings. It would be like a, a program that ran every time there was a match. It would pull in the match data from practice score and <clears throat> and uh, recalculate. And we'd have some sort of algorithmic points based. I don't know, ranking system. Yeah. So would you want to try to make it like rankings per division? So like Nils could be like the number one shooter in single stack and limited and carry optics and production all at once. Or would you just be like one list of these are the best shooters in the country? I think I really think you would want both. Uh, like, I think you would want to know. Oh, well, I mean, who, you, you could do yeah. both. Yeah. I mean, that's for me. Yeah. I would want both. I would want per division, like who are the top players in each division and then a cumulative an overall. Um, yeah, and obviously this is, it's only going to be able to include. Well, actually I don't even know that I, right now I'm thinking only what's in, in practice score. Cause I think I can. I can access that data without any sort of real issues. Um, but, you know, maybe you could pull some data from some, some Ipsic, Ipsic sources. I don't, I don't really know. I haven't looked into that. Yeah. I mean, Ipsic has their own uh, ranking system and I don't know exactly what they, they, they use some, they're, they're based off of ELO. Do you call it ELO? Yeah. ELO. ELO yeah. Uh, I would call it ELO. Um, they, they do, they base it somewhat off of that, but I haven't looked like super deep into how, how they're doing theirs. Um, luckily they, theirs at least has Eric Grafell as first. So like, at least like they've got the obvious part, right? Um, so that's good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think it'd be really cool. Like I, I like the ranking systems like it, like as far as like, what does it do? Like some people are getting kind of on the, on the discord. They're like, well, why do we need to do this? Like, it's going to. Like the we have the classifier system. It's like, well, this is totally different than the classifier system. Classifier system is like your handicap in golf, but it has nothing to do as far as like who's the actual best golfer. Yeah. I mean, a little bit. Like you can kind of say, okay, you're a five handicap, so you'll probably beat the ten handicap. Well, another thing that I um, think could be cool, like it could be utilized for, is like you could have a match that you have to qualify for. Uh, you could have mm, like yeah. an invitational for only, you know, yep. the top 20 people for a division or top 30 people, whatever. Um, so we don't have anything like that. Yeah. You know, we have percentages, but anybody can zero or hero their way to a, a crazy percentage. Um, I, say, I yeah. say anybody. A lot of people can. Um, right. So I think it would be cool to have yeah, a The only thing that's really close to that is the world shoot, right? But even that's really more of like it's the best from the country, so it's not necessarily all the best shooters in the world. Yeah. Like if it was all the best shooters in the world, America would have a lot more than fifty shooters at it. Um, and so, yeah, that I mean that would be really cool uh, to be able to kind of pigeonhole that into there. Yeah. So for me, like the the whole data analyzation doesn't intrigue me, but I kind of like the idea of like doing like a power rankings, which is just like like ESPN's power rankings for they have it for virtually everything 
because uh, it gives them something to talk about. But like, it's really more of you get a panel of people go in and they argue and vote on this is the best shooter this month. This is the best shooter in the country. Hmm. Uh, and so you have like a running top 25 and people can fall off of that or jump onto that. Uh, okay. Uh, either based by activity or based by performance. Yeah, that would be interesting if we did like a, I don't know, you probably wouldn't do, you probably do like 15. Yeah, how deep you could go would be kind of interesting. I don't know exactly how deep we could go on it, um, but 15 might be kind of where it's at. That would be kind of interesting to do almost as a. All right, I'm going to grab a beer. I'll be right back. Okay. So everybody can hear the Sasquatch just joined us. Uh, oh. We've already, we already got started Sasquatch, but. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, you can go ahead and go get, yeah, your, get your beer, your pale ale or whatever you're, whatever you're drinking. No, no, I'll wait. I'll wait. Sorry. No, go ahead. We're no, you're fine. Go get your beer. Hey, I was running late, man. Let's go. You good. <laughs> we are going. <laughs> we- uh, so yeah, I, I actually kind of like doing like a monthly, like, like if the hit back, if we had a website, uh, and we could do like, like monthly power rankings. It's something that to me, like it sounds like I would love to do that. And I feel like I would maybe fail to update that every month. Uh, Possibly. There would be some yeah. work involved in that. <laughs> um, I have lots of great ideas that oftentimes don't get carried through. Yeah. But uh, more the, that art. would be, I think that'd be fun. Uh, Cause I think it would generate conversations uh, if nothing else. So more the idea, man, not the uh, follow through guy. Well, it's just, you can only follow through on so many ideas. Mm. Uh, I, I, well, here's well, here's a solution. You can hire Jeff to come be a gunsmith for you. He can fit barrels really well. We saw that picture. Uh, and then, then you'll have more free time. Like you can still charge yeah. the same amount of money and Jeff can build the guns. I, I think I might. It would maybe take me six, six months tops before like I had zero business left. <laughs> I don't think it would take. No, it would, it'd take longer than that. You have like a year backlog right now. No, I've got like three, but they would all jump off as soon as pictures were posted of the first one mm-hmm. that Jeff finished. No doubt. And then that customer would post pictures from the inside of the gun. And yeah, it would be, mm-hmm. it'd be game over all real right, quick. Right. Jeff does the inside, you do the outside. There we go. Yeah, so they're, so, they're giving me a hard uh, time because I fit a thumb safety to my 1911 you know the 1911 that had a dysfunctional thumb safety um at nationals in 2020 so i fit a new thumb safety so i could go shoot a match with my 1911 this last weekend and yeah there was a lot of there was a lot of uh making making fun of jeff going around that's okay jeff i'm curious how long it took you to fit that thumb safety? Not that was long. Was this an ambi or single side? Uh, ambi. An ambi safety. Okay. Yeah. So that makes it harder. I mean, I, no. How? See, I don't even know why that makes it harder because I didn't do shit to one side. I, like, I literally didn't do anything to one side. Well, you have to install both sides at the same time to know if it's fitting correctly because that changes the angle of the shaft as it sits in the frame. See, I don't even know what you're talking about. So you can't just stick half of it in there and <laughs> and like cut it to what that half is because as soon as you put the other half in there, it changes how the first half is sitting in the frame. I don't think Jeff did that part. I don't. I got, yeah, that doesn't even make space. sense to me. I don't. I don't understand. Why would that change? Okay. Because it can sit in the frame at an angle, which would move the thumb safety further away from or closer to the sear depending on how it sits and so then once you put the other half in there it lines it up correctly you have two holes like the thumb safety sits in two holes on either side of the frame Mm -hmm. if you only have it in one side there's a certain amount of wobble in that i got you whereas if you put the other side in it tightens that wobble up i got you i'm well i probably got lucky because this was like a pretty freaking tight to get in anywhere like the the shaft on on the one side that you actually have to to work on, the mm-hmm. the left side. What safety did you use? Uh, well, it was a Wilson, but it was like a really shitty Wilson part. So I guess I just ordered the wrong Fuck. one. Yeah, they they have a uh, 
a value they have a one. nice machined part and they have a, a much cheaper one yeah well i got the cheaper so, one yeah unintentionally um so yeah was it was like super tight going in on the one side like just the just the the shaft part um that pins mm-hmm. the the grip safety in yeah uh yeah so i mean yeah anyway i didn't do it right but it works and it has no slop so i'm all right does the sear have any slop not that i know of i mean how are how are all the ways you test well you need to pull the grip safety out Mm mm-hmm Put the have leave the hammer and this like leave all the trigger components in. Pull the grip safety out. Put the thumb safety in with no grip safety, and look at it. Cock the hammer, engage the thumb safety, and watch that sear and see if it moves. Because you can watch it right from yeah. behind. And I you, think if I that sear's moving, if that sear's moving at all, you're done effed up. Uh, well, it break works. Break out your stick welder and weld it up. I shot a whole. Uh, I mean, just for reference, yeah, like. So. Yeah, I mean, I don't think shooting a whole match necessarily qualifies as oh yeah, this is this is done correctly. I didn't say it was done correctly. It just works. I, I feel like you. Well, f- I feel like you find out the safety didn't work when you take the safety off and the gun goes bang before you hit the trigger. Well, yeah, you find out the safety doesn't work whenever like that's immediately followed by a trip to the ER is how the, how you find out. Uh, how that if it works right. or not um just for reference like it it usually takes me at like two three hours to like okay to like really fit one well like so like i spend like i know and i i kind of know what i'm doing there so yeah like if you just like fit it in like 15 minutes then like i would be thinking hmm this it might be working now, but we don't know how long it's gonna last. Gotcha. Yeah. Sounds like so I should uh, keep an eye. Sounds on like it Jeremy can do it for you at Area Three. Well, I have to bring a new part. That's yeah, no big deal though. Jeremy will do the fitting for free. He can grab some files. Yeah, yeah. Right after we have a pitcher of margaritas at that Mexican food place. Sounds like plan. I'll fit him with some thumb safety then. <laughs> Anyway, I uh, all right. It is working right now, and it's working better than the one I took out. Hey. I'll just that's all. I'll, I'll I'll qualify it that. Jeff, way. was that's it, at least good. Was the factory thumb safety in it the one that didn't work? No, it was not. Well, I mean, if it was factory, someone went in and butchered it and then put it back in. Okay, uh, I was gonna say if it was factory, you could just let me know and I'll send you a shipping label and then Caleb will fix it for you. <laughs> Jeff, it was factory. Send it to Caleb and it see if factory. you can fit a thumbs up. Everything on this gun is factory. I've not done go. anything to it. Uh, email- I think it needs to go to Caleb and he needs to work the gun over. Email me it. email me the serial number in the morning. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> so, Jeff actually did shoot. Uh, he busted out his single stack. This is why he had to do this. He busted out his single stack. And he went and shot. It was like a local match that was, but it, it was single stack only. Is it, am I understanding no, that right? So there was a bunch of local guys that had a, a bet going. I, w- I wasn't there for the, the inception of the, the bet, but they had a bet. It was like everybody was going to show up. They weren't going to practice with their single stacks. Uh, and everybody was going to shoot single stack. And whoever lost was going to buy, buy the beer afterwards. Uh, so anyway okay. they told me everybody was shooting single stack so i showed up and it was fun and uh i i assume you did not have to buy beer for everyone no i didn't have to buy beer for everyone no that's i mean that's good yeah uh and how did you feel going back to the canic this morning to dry fire oh it was it was bitter man it was bitter <laughs> I uh no, I I dry fired the the 1911 like 3 3 or 4 sessions. So just last week. And dude, it just feels so much better. It uh like I I don't know if it's because of how my hands are shaped or if it's because I literally learned to shoot on the 1911 
And so I, I developed like my grip pressure and like how my grip is formed on, on a pistol and everything on the 1911. But it, uh, right. it just feels significantly better than, than anything else. And like even not shooting it for two years, it's been two years, almost two years. Um, and then going back to it, it was like immediately felt better, immediately pointed better. And it, like the trigger on that gun is heavier than my canning, like significantly. Uh, it's, it's, not, hard to beat. it's not a nice trigger. It's, it's never been worked over or anything. It's not a nice one. It's heavy. And I could still shoot it better. Um, yeah. So that's just my love affair with the 1911. I mean, I am obviously extremely biased uh, towards the 1911, but uh, I would I would contend that um, if people like chose their just division just off of enjoyment of shooting, the night the single stack division would be a whole lot more popular uh, than what it is. Um, True, and that like just because like they are just a lot of fun to shoot. And they, they feel great. They point great. Like they're just, they're just, they're just cool guns. I'm not quite as biased as Jeremy. As long as it's made out of metal and it's hammer fired, it's an okay gun. I mean, that's, that is better. Uh, hammer fired is always is better. Uh, so, uh, so Jeff and I were talking a little bit, uh, cause I mean, I, Jeff and I are kind of both in the same boat a little bit and that we had been planning on shooting nationals early in the year. We're signed up for nationals. Uh, it got changed and both of us are no longer shooting nationals. And it's, I mean, it's weird. I mean, to me, it's, it's two years in a row for me almost, although I did it to myself last year, but this year it's like the rugs like just been pulled out from under you. And so like, it's really a reevaluation of shooting, at least in the meantime. Um, I know for me, like, I still really enjoy shooting. It just like from the top, it's so it's kind of so messed up um, that it's it is a struggle to that drive to like really compete hard um, is 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 uh, diminished. I would say because of kind of how messed up the top of the sport is. Um, yeah. I I don't think it's going to stay like this like forever. Like. I just, I kind of don't, I think we're in a, we're in a bad cycle right now. That's just my, maybe my too positive an outlook, which may surprise most people uh, that would have a positive outlook. But uh, I feel like that's where we're at as a sport. Like we're just in a kind of a low cycle and it's going to get better, but it, I mean, it is tough um, to not have that, that competition side to really kind of push, push for right now. Um, So how are you feeling about that Jeff, like with shooting and that sort of stuff right now? Um, uh, I mean, yeah, about the same. Uh, it just, it's, it's difficult to stay, to stay hungry for like, uh, just to have any sort of drive or it makes it more difficult to to even have discipline, I think. Cause, cause you question why you're having discipline. You know, people say you need discipline, not motivation, but but it takes away like your reasons to, to implement your discipline. It's like, why, why, why am I driving myself so hard for this when so much is, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's, it's a draining feeling of what's going around in the sport right now. But yeah. And, and on top of that, like, like Jeremy said, like I'm, I would, I would rather shoot single stack. It is far more fun for me. I shoot the gun way better, as I just said. Um, but I moved to production for the competitive reason, uh, to shoot mm-hmm. against better people more frequently. And, yeah, we know how that turned out. Um, Quit going to divisions, so, Jeff. You kill them. Yeah. yeah all, every go to PCC I go to next, dies. please. <laughs> and then yeah. open. Right. I'm going to go shoot CO just just to kill it 
just to sabotage it. That's a great, yeah, just, good call. Yeah. So that's that's kind of where I'm at, and like I'm, I want to finish out the year like competing against the people I want to compete at at the area matches, um, but at the same time, I don't like. I just want to go back and shoot single stack and and enjoy it and travel around shooting a, an awesome gun that I enjoy. Because like when I when I dry fire the single stack. Like, I don't want to stop. I don't want to put it down. Uh, just because I, I just love holding that gun. Yeah. And uh, it's, I don't, like, sometimes I get that feeling with the Canic. Sometimes. Uh, when I'm just really enjoying the process. But, and I think other people are a little more disconnected from from their actual pistols than I am. Like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tinkerer. I'm a... I like to fiddle with things and so like little you know tools things to work on are fascinating to me so uh, I pay a lot so more attention to the guns for you yes so I like I pay a lot more attention to the things I'm shooting than other like other people it's just a tool it's just like what they use to compete and for yeah. me it is to some degree but I'm also like I've been a tinker mechaniker you know dabble in in welding all putting things together like i i love mechanical things i love quality mechanical things and and so i i fiddle with my guns a lot even if i'm not working on them i just fiddle with them yeah sounds like to me you're trying i get that sounds like to me you're trying to talk yourself into shooting single stack oh i think he's already talked himself into it it's just he's just got to decide when he's going to make the switch (laughs) Uh, yeah, I mean, pretty much the question is, do I finish out the year shooting production, or if you were shooting, do I switch and I shoot against? Say... I don't know. I could go shoot limited. I could just take my ten round mags and shoot limited at every match I go to. Yeah, I would say if you were shooting um, nationals, obviously you should stay in production. But other than that. The only other major you really got where there's going to be anyone in production is Area 3, right? Next month? Yeah, that's the only other match I'm signed up for right now. And I may, I still haven't decided, and my window is closing pretty quickly on if I'm going to go to Area 7, but that would be the other one. That's a long ways. Yeah. I won't be driving you to that match. I think you can. And that'll be an expensive plane ticket. Yeah, this late. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I I mean, shooting single stack, uh, I mean, the only thing that we could possibly do is area three. Like, if you decided to switch to single stack, I would probably switch to single stack uh, for that match. Uh, So it'd be like three people. Right, exactly. That's, I mean, like, you are going to find, like, there are going to be since production nationals is still happening uh, later in the year for some people. Uh, you are going to find people competing in that division. So production, I didn't look at who's registered, but Area Three should be pretty solid because Casey's been shooting production again. Uh, Joel will be there. I'll be there. Currently, Jeff signed up. Um, there's a couple other guys from up in Minnesota area that I think are signed up that are pretty good. So, and I don't know who else from out of town's coming in. I mean, Jacob Hetherington usually shoots that match, but he's kind of split in time with with three gun a lot here lately. But I saw, I think I did see an Instagram post from Jacob that he uh, was shooting his um, was he stock threes. Is that what he had, or is he or was he on a shadow two? Uh, I, I thought he had stock threes for a while. He used to. He got he switched to shadow two oranges a while back. I don't know if he's still shooting them or not. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so he, he might be there. I, who, I, I haven't looked at a list, but there's a chance that Nils would shoot production there, but I'm going to guess he's shooting CO that, that's, since that's coming up in September. I think that'll suck a yeah. lot of people that shoot both divisions away. Yeah. Yep. So, no, I get it. Uh, I mean, that, that is a little bit tough. Um, and I don't want to dwell. On, I don't want to dwell on that too much because I don't want to be like, like people do listen to the podcast. I don't want to be like. 
I feel if we're if we're down about the sport, like we're gonna like influence people to that are already struggling with motivation a little bit to like be even less motivated. So I don't want to I don't want to be that at all for anybody. Um, I'll say for me, like I have I've been to the range a couple times since Area One, like just just gone to the range a couple times. Um, and for me, like guys like Jeff and other people that like dry fire and like their dry fire is their motivation without a whole lot of live fire, really, man, that like more power to you guys. Like, I, I think I w- was maybe like that when I first got into the sport. Um, but I have to live fire to make myself like, it's like, I go live fire. It's like, okay, stuff doesn't work quite like I want it to. And that's what motivates me to, to get up and dry fire in the morning. Um, but my live fires have been basically just pure. How fast can I go? Cause that right now that's, what's fun. And I like, that's all I care about at this point. Uh, I'm not like the mistakes that are happening. Like they're, they're big. Uh, there's lots of mistakes, uh, like very numerous. Um, but it's, it's going to be kind of an interesting process as I try, hopefully try to get shooting a little bit more frequently, not, not all the time, but more frequently than I have since, you know, twice in the past four weeks last month over a month um to like the goal is not to slow down the goal is to just do stuff right at that same speed and uh and just see where i see where i end up um see how how that ends up i'm kind of i'm actually changing my technique a little bit too like i've always shot i've never shot like arms locked out i've always kind of shot uh with the gun elbows a bit bent and um so i'm kind of i'm kind of messing with with locking the arms out and seeing if that helps some of my uh moving the gun as i'm pulling the trigger uh i do i do a lot of like trying to it's just i mean it's just a bad habit that had just crept in probably from shooting too much i don't know uh like i move the gun as i pull the trigger and so trying to see if if locking the elbows will help that it's not an, um, it's not a straightaway immediate fix, but also like I haven't, I haven't shot enough, haven't trained enough to know if it's going to be, but I, I kind of like it. It's kind of interesting. Have you, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you've heard people talk about the, like, uh, I think like Wansick and, and Joel and those guys talk about it a lot, the like wrist lock or locking your joints like even in like yeah. bent positions. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people are confused by that. Um, I actually even heard somebody who's like a very good shooter uh, at a recent match being like, what does that even mean? Like what, what is, what is locking your wrist? Uh, so anyway, I was just curious if, if that was something that you did. Cause I know you, you do shoot with bent arms. If like you consciously like, locked your your elbows in, into that and try to like not let them flex or or anything like that no um i, I haven't really put like a a real conscious effort into like how far or how close the gun is away from me because that's really kind of what you're doing you're either, the gun's either closer to you or further away from you um yeah and i haven't really ever put a lot of conscious effort into that other than i've I've always kind of done what was comfortable and what I felt like I could comfortably grip the gun the hardest that way. Um, yeah. But that's also somewhat like your, what is your perception of gripping the gun hard? Um, yeah. It may not necessarily be what is putting the most pressure on the gun. Um, it, dude, there's so many people that do it so many different ways that like, yeah, I, I would just be so hesitant to ever tell anybody like, this is how you should do it. Um, cause people have been right. successful yeah. so many different ways. Um, it's just something that I kind of wanted to mess with and see if that was, see if that would be something that would kind of help me out, uh, get past. And it, I mean, it, you know, you kind of ch- sometimes change for the sake of change is almost good. Cause it gives you new feedback, gives you new sensations and it kind of may make you more aware of stuff that you haven't maybe been aware of recently. Well, I think, yeah. like most things, too, you have to remember in shooting, there's, like, generally what most people will agree on is kind of the preferred way. 
but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the only way. Kind of like Eric Rappel puts his finger on the front of the trigger guard. Like, 95% of good shooters would tell you not to do that. But, I mean, clearly it works for him, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way. I mean, it, it's, I mean, the, the Eric deal is, it's surprising that more people don't do it because he does it, because he's so dominant. I mean, like, he's far and away the best shooter in our sport. Uh, right. Like, nobody's close to him. That's probably the same sauce right there. I, I mean, I mean, like, yeah, we know that that's not. But, like, it is shocking. Any other sport, if you had somebody that was, like, the the best, like, for as long as Eric has been the best in the sport, um, like, people would adopt stuff like that. Like, they would 100% be doing it. And yet, you don't see anybody. The only person I know that does that kind of like he does is Lena Mitchlick. Um, Angus yeah. uh, always shot that way, too. He doesn't really shoot. Angus much. does? Okay. Yeah. I never I never noticed that he put a finger up there. And I, I saw some other shooter here in the last six months video of a shooter that was doing it. Um, but wasn't a – it wasn't mm-hmm. like a – he was a good shooter, but not a named, a known, a known shooter, at least to me. Um, so yeah, that that one's that's you know, kind of interesting. What's also kind of interesting is, I mean, along the same lines, like why don't more people mimic that or copy that? Um, just from like a sports science standpoint, like you hear uh, weightlifters, like competitive weightlifters. Um, they, they do this, right? Like they see somebody who's super successful and they use that as a technical model to, to base their, their sports science around. They're like, okay, this is what they're doing at this part of this lift. So let's break it down and, and mimic it because it's more successful than anything we've seen. And yeah, we're, we're not there yet, obviously, in this sport, but that is how sports science has evolved over the years. You see somebody, they figure something out. Mm-hmm. It's way more successful than, than it, what everybody else is doing. So people take it as a technical model. They break it down, and they mimic it and train it, and then you know the cycle continues. Yeah. But yeah, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it really is. I mean, like that – I would I would love to have somebody who, like, come from the golf world – that is like, like studies all of like the sports science part of the golf world and like that knowledge of, of that science, not necessarily of the golf swing and all that, but the knowledge of the science of it, like come and like dive into our sport and like, just, I feel like, like the book that they would come out with, if they actually did that be like, all these shooters are like crazy. Like they're missing, they've, they're like 50 years behind on on sports science and, and everything that they're doing, right, uh, yeah. they could be way more advanced if they wanted to be. Um, I mean, it helps when you've got prize tables that are, I think the yeah. most recent major golf major was over $3 million. Um, We're just a little short on that. Just mm-hmm. first, just for first place. And I mean, money, money helps advance a whole lot of stuff whole, real quickly. Um, but I've talked to like maybe, I know one person, maybe two people that have actually done that in this sport. Okay. Um, that they take or they, they collect, you know, everybody's technique. They have, they have folders on their, on their computers of just these specific people shooting. And they, they do, they break down their technique and they study it and, and they go from there. They don't necessarily mimic it, but they are. They're studying each person's technique and, and trying to evolve the sports science yeah. um, of the sport. So I have I have met people that do that in the sport, but they it's not uh, it's not sports science that they're publishing or right. or really anything like that. You know, they might be sharing it in their their private circles, but yeah, yeah. No, I mean that's cool. Uh, hopefully, that stuff kind of does become public uh, at some point, which would be be pretty interesting i i would understand why they they would keep that uh private and want to sh- not want to share that because it's they did all the work so you don't want to just give that yeah, away yeah. for free um mm-hmm. oh i know something jeff do you we had a discussion on the discord and 
I made the statement. There's always going to be surprised that I made some wild statement that if you're short, you're slow. And I said, AKA Jeff, because Jeff is short. So Jeff's slow. And Jeff's like, we can race anytime when you want to race. Um, so Jeff, like, when are we racing? Like, what distance are we racing? What what are we doing? Area three, Berm, uh, Bay one to Bay ten, and back to Bay one. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So the thing here is, I'm I'm pretty damn confident in like a you know sub four hundred meter. That I could smoke chair. What do you think you can run a 400? Uh, but I'm also pretty confident in anything over that, that Jeremy is going to smoke me. Yeah. The longer the race gets, the the bigger the gap is going to be for Jeff and I uh, to a yeah. point. Uh, if it got much over like probably four or five miles, I think we'd both would just quit. Um, but uh, I, I'm not the quickest person in the world, so I don't, I don't know that like a hundred meter race, there's, there's a good chance Jeff might beat me at that. Uh, so I feel like, I feel like 400, um, you know, that's still a sprint. I mean, Olympically that's still considered a sprint, but for you and I, Jeff, that's not a sprint. Like that's, there's some condition right. yeah, yeah, yeah. going in at that point. Uh, I would say right. a 400 to a half would be pretty good. I think actually, I because I think at a half is actually where that's going to be where I probably start breaking away because I think you could suffer through a half a mile. I think you could suffer through enough of that. Uh, I don't think I you see, could my, suffer. Yeah, too my much strategy would be my strategy would just be to hang with you till close to the end of the half, and and then and then suffer for the last fifty. But on area three, mm-hmm. we just break onto the local high school track. It'll be best out of three, so we'll we'll see who's winning at four hundred, who's winning at eight hundred, and then who wins at uh, sixteen hundred, which is basically quarter, half, and whole mile. If you, uh, if Jeff, I will be if Jeff wins at the, least a Jeff beats I'll you. I'll be at least a half lap ahead of Jeff by the mile. All right. Yeah, probably. Area, th- I mean, that's pretty soon. I can't even train for that. <laughs> Area three. You got a month. Oh God! No, I'm not. I'm not going to a local track at Area Three and, and running a mile. I don't want to do that. That doesn't sound fun. We can just pick a date. We can pick a date. We have people vote in. Who do they think is going to win? Me or Jeff? Jeff needs to pick the distance. Um, and I think we should race two, possibly three distances. Okay. Pick the distances. So we should do like a sprint and then we should do like a, what, a four, four or 600 meter. And then we, we got to do a mile. We got to do okay. a mile. Right. You pick the date. Uh, we don't have to, we can do it in person if you want. You pick the date, you pick the time. It's got to be in person. It's got to be in uh, person. Jeff is, Jeff is one, he's feeling the need to be able to feed off of that adrenaline. Uh, of it being in person. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, it's actually imperative <laughs> that there be some <laughs> adrenaline involved if I'm going to survive. Sasquatch, you want in? No, I don't enjoy running. I've ran enough miles in my life. I don't enjoy running either. I just <laughs> have to do it. I mean, I don't guess I have to, but... I really enjoy running for very short distances. I look forward to it. Uh, we'll have to get it in. Um Jeff, you got questions for us? We got Oh, I know there's there's a question that I do want to answer. Uh and it was was it Viking that asked it? It was one of the most recent questions. I can pull it up. Uh him and a you, him and a buddy were shooting. It, I think he's shooting like he's from he's from like Sweden or something. Oh, no, this isn't Viking. This is Kaiser IPSC. He's from isn't he from Finland? Uh he says, me and a buddy will be competing for national title in October. How can we challenge each other in the coming period but still focus on our own performance? Is it even smart to be squatted together? 
So I think Kaiser was actually like our I've, first international listener. Uh, he might not have been the first, but he's the first one that I know of. So what do you guys think of that? Um, uh, so this is kind of a two part question, right? I can I can only answer for me. Yeah. Um, as long as my as long as my buddy was also serious, like it wouldn't affect me at all. But I wouldn't want to squad with someone who's like just doesn't care about competing at all at nationals but as long as they're like as long as they give a crap and they're gonna like walk the stages seriously and you know actually like try to shoot then it wouldn't bother me at all yeah i mean his question makes it sound like him and his buddy are both competing for a national title so it sounds like they're both yeah they are both wanting to win then it would be it'd be fine so the question is how can we challenge each other in the coming period but still focus on our own performance uh, let's just say they're living close enough to uh, like they can train together if they want. He doesn't give that, but I'm just going to assume that uh, that that's the case. All right. Well, uh, I mean, I like to occasionally train with other people. I do most of my training by myself, but you know, say like every like 10th training session, if you could uh, get together with each other, that'd probably be helpful. Uh, another set of eyes or somebody else, you know, to push you a little bit on drills and stuff is never a bad thing. And then otherwise, you know, if you've got some majors between now and nationals, squad together at those and see how it goes. Yeah. What do you think, Jeff? Um, so you didn't really say, are they competing against, are they competing for the same national mm-hmm. title? Like against mm-hmm. each other? Okay. Um, all right. Well, as far as, um, how you could push yourself in, in training together. Um, yeah, challenge each other in the coming period. So I'm, I'm assuming, like Jeremy said, you could train together at some point. That I think that's what he's asking. Like, how would you do that if you're training together? Um, so one of my favorite things to do when training with somebody who is uh, pretty close to equal skill level is to, like, set up something and then you each take like two stabs at it you each takes two tries at it and you know someone sets the bar then someone tries to beat the bar and then someone gets to set the bar again or try to beat that bar uh and then someone else does it again and it's like i think it's amazing like it's my favorite way to train with somebody that's yep. good is to go out there set something up each try to do it do it really fast. You know, you might, you might talk about it or you, you find something that's really interesting. Maybe you, maybe you run it four times, but uh, you can kind of get through some weeds on that and uh, challenge each other really well and push each other. And it, I think it's really fun, but then you set up something different and you do the same thing and you just kind of continue the cycle and maybe you, you take turns doing the setup. So somebody can set up something that they're kind of, they're strong at, maybe they're stronger at moving. So they set up something a little longer. Maybe someone else is better at distance shooting, so they set up an array that has distance shooting. And uh, I think that is a fantastic way to to push a, a training partner in, in that way. Um, and then as far as, like, should you squad together? Um, I think that really depends on on how what you and your buddy's relation, shooting relationship is like. Um, like I have people that, that I'm friends with that I I don't really like shooting with and I have people that I don't mind shooting with. So it, it, it just depends. Like some people are totally fine. Some people are, are not totally fine. Um, some people, yeah, it, it, that, it just depends on that relationship. Yeah. Um, most people I don't mind shooting with. Yeah. Uh, I I think he's actually in a bit of a unique situation. Um, I'm gonna have to make some assumptions because we don't have we don't know a whole lot. Uh, this this is really gonna depend on what their personalities are like, what their friendship is like. Um, I'm assuming based on what he said that they are pretty close, similar skill set. Like one could win or the other could win. Like if one just has a better match, they're gonna win. Like it's not necessarily one is better than the other. Uh, so I'm going to make those assumptions. So like, that's how I'm tempering my answer. 
But if that if that is your situation and it's a good buddy of yours and you genuinely want to see like your buddy do well, um, then like you're in a kind of a cool situation that like you could train together and like you could almost become each other's coach because like we are a, a kind of a weird sport in that almost nobody really has a coach. You might go to a training class or something like that, but most people don't have coaches. Um, and so having somebody who's close to your skill level that can see you shooting, they can like help coach you in practice and like really kind of take a little bit of ownership in your shooting. Uh, and then you can also take a bit of an ownership in their shooting. Um, that can be beneficial for both of you. And even, even, at the match, like helping the other person, like knowing what their, their strong points are, like giving them the encouragement, like, Hey, this is like, I see you getting stressed out. Like, let's, let's go do some breathing exercises. Let's get ourselves calmed down. Uh, or just even pumping them up. Like maybe, maybe, you know, that your buddy is like, they just get stressed and they get real slow and they're real sluggish first thing. And so they just need somebody to be a little bit of a hype man for them or something like, like, I think like that could be kind of a really cool thing that if both of you were trying to get the best out of the other person, um, that could be really cool, uh, to like, that could be just a fun experience, but it could also get you both shoot really well. Um, but that again, totally depends on each other's personalities. Um, the, the only thing I can, I mean, I, I have a couple of things to compare it to, but like Bob Crow and I have never really gotten to train. We've had like one or two practice sessions together, but it's more just like, Hey, we're, we're in the same town and we, we shot together and we haven't like really ever trained together. Um, we have shot together a ton of matches and I struggle to shoot well when I shoot with Bob. Uh, like it's just. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't shoot that well whenever I shoot with Bob because I do too much comparing myself to him. And so, like, and that's just a recipe for disaster for that. Mm -hmm. And so, if that's going to be the case for you, Kaiser, that, like, if you're going to be really just comparing yourself to the to your buddy and that that's going to have a bad influence on you, then maybe Nationals isn't, isn't the best time to – compete together if the competition part of it is really the only thing that matters to you. Um, I don't regret, even though I haven't shot well with Bob, I've never regretted squatting with Bob. Like I would not have ever, I would never, I wouldn't go back in time and ever squad differently, like get away from him at a match. Um, and so like that, so you know, that just kind of depends on where, where you're at. But I say squad together and try to help each other do as, as well as possible and see what, see what comes out of that. Um, I'd much rather, if it was me and my bite, I'd much rather see us go one, two and me be second than me win and him get 10th. Well, I, I, I'd, I'd rather see, I'd rather see both of us be successful. And on some level, I mean, if they're both, I don't know how every country does it, but obviously if they're both competing for the national title in the U.S., we have the super squads and stuff. So good chances that you you need to be prepared to squad with your fellow competitors that are, you're also competing with to win. If you're True. if you're in the running yeah. for the win. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know how how those like the national matches in Ipsic if they do that or not. I, I really just do not know. Yeah, I'm not sure. All right, Jeff, more questions. Oh, wait, I need to clarify something real quick. Do it. Jeremy said I was short. Aren't you like I'm five not nine? short. No, and five no, nine is short. average. I'm 5'11". Sure. Everybody thinks I'm six foot. No, people are being nice to you. Okay, I'm done. Uh, okay. I mean, yeah. If that's how you want to clarify it, that's fine. Um, yeah, that's all. Yeah. That's all I had to say. I mean, most people don't consider 5'11 short, so you're just an <laughs> asshole. So, 
Okay. Stage design and difficulty level. We we kind of touched on this in our last Q and A sesh, but we'll knock this one out. Okay, what would you consider an appropriate distance for hardcover targets, tuxedos specifically? On a Virginia count, we canned only strong hand only stage. Hard enough to test higher end shooters, but not so difficult where C class or lower end shooters can't hit them at all. What do you consider too difficult okay, on so that target? I'm going to say this based on you saying it's strong hand and weak hand and Virginia count. I don't want that target past 10 yards, not a tuxedo. Like you have like no margin for error. At, at, at you start stretching that target to like 15 yards, It I think it gets too difficult. And then the average guy is going to get murdered on that stage. Uh, me personally, on a um, on a okay. standard stage like a Virginia count stage, I don't, I don't want to see a zebra on that stage. Period. Like the, like to me, like the the fact that it is Virginia count, the fact that there is a part time. Um, did he, I don't know if he said part time. Maybe he just said Virginia, but it sounded like he, he yeah, was he kind of describing Virginia. a standard stage. Um, to me, like. Yeah, I don't. I don't personally. I don't really want to see a zebra on on that stage. Um, like that's. Just, I wouldn't. I personally wouldn't design a stage like that. That's, yeah, kind of build on that, you know. The <laughs> if if that is his question, I would say that there is some failed logic there too, and that you're you're trying to make it challenging for the better shooters when really all you're doing is making it excessively difficult. Where the best guys are still going to win the stage most likely, but it's just going to murder everyone else. It's like, it's not a good stage. If, if half the people are going to have a penalty on the stage, it's not going to be a good stage. Well, that was not the question. You, Jeremy, you like changed Did the I? whole question. <laughs> yeah. So, well, at first you said you wouldn't even put a tuxedo target on, and then you brought part times in like it's a standard stage. And wasn't it, it how far a tux- there. He just wants to know. It just the question was, what would you consider the appropriate distance for this target on this stage? He's, he's not asking like how to make it. He's asking like, what is a good distance like for the lower end shooters? Oh. What's a good distance about 300 for that yards target away to in the storage at? shed? Uh, I'll say like a, a Virginia count stage, say... zebra, uh, seven yards. Strong hand weekend, Virginia count. Also. Right, right. Yeah, with strong hand weekend, seven yards. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Between seven and ten yards, like Jared said. I think Jared's right. Any any further than that, it's I mean, yeah, it's it'd a be no-go. extremely difficult at 15 yards. If even if in a, if you didn't have Comstock scoring, like it's like good luck. This stage could cost you the entire match. Yeah, I mean, like I wouldn't necessarily mind a, like a fifteen yard zebra, even if you had to shoot it strong hand or weak hand. But ha- making it Virginia, where you can't make it up, because like fifteen yards, like we can, like I can be as careful as I want to be and still kink it off into the hardcover. And with with no ability to make that up, mm-hmm. uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't enjoy that. Yeah, yeah, I would say definitely no further than ten yards. Cool, ten yards. There it is, thirty feet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. One more. You keep it up. One? Let me find a shorter one. Uh, does your grip change when shooting a 1911 versus a double stack gun? Um, no. No. I'm mean, assuming, like, assuming talking about going 1911 mm-hmm. to like a 2011. Um, that I don't. Well, that's that's the only double right. stack yeah. gun you shoot, I right? A, 
I don't have a DWX yet. So it's in the mail. Right. Yeah. Your, your FedEx guy probably lost it. Yeah. Uh, Jared, did your grip change when you switched like no. four years ago? I mean, it, five at years the end ago. of the day, you hold every gun the same way. Like you get your hand as deep as you can in the beaver tail, and then you fill in the remaining space with your weak hand. Like I don't notice any difference. I would say, like when I used to shoot 2011s, the nice thing on them was they fit my hand really well. So does a 1911 with like a Dawson ice on it. They fit my hand super well, so I feel super in control of those guns. But I still grip them the same way I do a Shadow mm-hmm. Two. So for me, I would say I try. I try to use the same grip as a 1911 on my Canic, but it's not really the same because I can't quite get into the same position. This gun, uh, the Canic, like it's not as lengthy, like front to back, like the grip isn't as, as long as my 1911 is. So I can't quite get as much of my support hand on the, the actual grip. And then also I, I really like, push down or I really put my thumb, put a lot of pressure on the, the thumb safety. Um, I, I use that quite heavily on the 1911 and that's not there. Also the beaver tail area is a lot wider on the canic, like the back of the gun is a lot wider. So I can't even bring my thumb up close to the mm. gun on the canic. Like it just kind of has to, to shoot out to the side because my knuckle can't get past the back of the gun. So my grip is quite a bit different though. I try to make it as close as possible. You know, I'm still using the same like grip principles, like the same type of pressure, but my hand is, is on the gun differently just because the gun is shaped differently. Yeah, that makes sense. Don't ski. All right, let's find another one. Does Ipsic make sense in the U.S. as a replacement for what USPSA is becoming? Um, I would say no, because USPSA is the governing body of Ipsic for the U.S. Um, and Ipsic has their own problems. Uh, USPSA is certainly still very much in the stage of where you know any concerns can be corrected. It's just whether anyone wants to address what the actual issues are. But just switching to IPSC doesn't change anything. If if something would happen to USPSA, like way down the road, I'm, I'm sure a new sport will just develop. Yeah, I don't, I don't see uh, USPSA releasing its IPSC charter. Um, I would, I'd be surprised if they did that. They, I don't know. They might would, but um, Jared is right in that uh, we wouldn't. You're just changing one master for another, uh, and I don't know that we're getting better, uh, getting a better one. Uh, I don't. Obviously, we don't. I don't follow all of the the drama with Ipsic um, as closely as I do USPSA, but I'm pretty sure it's still there. And and the other thing, the reason why we have USPSA and, and we don't just have Ipsic is that. Ipsic is somewhat um, I'm trying to think of the right word, but they are they are they have to basically try to create a sport that is workable in all of the world's gun laws. Uh, and USBSA was like, no, um, we're America. Like we, we're free here and we get to do what we want. And so we're not going to allow France. And I'm just, I'm not, I'm just pick. I'm just picking a country. Like we're not going to allow the laws in France to change how we govern our sport here in America. Um, which is, I mean, it's very typical, very American response. And that may be oversimplifying, um, things a bit, but that's, that's kind of why we have, USPSA and then Ipsic because I mean Ipsic started here uh, like and then it became international uh, and so then at that point it was going in a direction that was different than what the shooters in America wanted and I, I somewhat appreciate that 
uh, that yeah, we you, United States is is unique compared to virtually every other country. Not to say that there aren't other countries that have uh, that are are bad or or aren't good or don't have friendly gun laws, but uh, we are somewhat unique for the most part to that. So. You know, the other thing on that too, though, is uh, with the asking that question, I would say it sounds like kind of wanting to abandon USPSA. And I, I definitely don't think USPSA is anywhere near the standpoint where people just need to abandon it. Uh, I mean, certainly if you're following online, it's got plenty of its own issues going on right now, but it's very much still in a salvageable place. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it would not surprise me if things stay like they are for another year or two, like if there is not something competing, somebody comes out with something, uh, a competing division. Uh, I don't know if infinity has the, has the backing, uh, if they're big enough to, to come up with something on their own, but like, I could see a company like that, that's been disenfranchised a bit, um, by the sport whether that's justified or not, we can, people can argue about that, but they've been disenfranchised. Basically their whole business model is based off of competition shooting. And so then maybe they want to start their own thing. Um, do they have the money to get that up and going? I don't know. Uh, they might could get some other people to go in with them and maybe they start their own series kind of like they were doing, they were going to do anyway. Um, you know, I could certainly see something like that happening. And then will it get ground support or not? Who knows? But it, it would be, it could be interesting to see. Yeah, I, w- I would love to see more large Ipsic matches in the U.S. though. Like we yeah. Got, we've got Pan American this year. That'll be pretty cool. I wouldn't mind seeing, you know, something like that once a year in the U.S., like a, a big Ipsic match. Yeah. Uh, like we had that extreme the one one time. Uh, in St. George before that range got blown uh, up and, yeah, and made ex- into another one. Extreme, uh, Pan American Extreme Open is also happening, but it's in uh, 2023. But Oh, I'm sorry. That wasn't the one I'm talking about. It wasn't extreme. It was the Magnus Cup is what it was. Magnus was kind of like they're from the Philippines and they were kind of doing like a their own series and they did one there. And like <clears throat> there were a whole bunch of international shooters that came out and shot it. And it was a really cool match. Uh, it was a that was a fun match, um, so yeah, I would. And then COVID happened, and it and we didn't have any more future of those. Um, so I would love to see more stuff like that take place. Uh, the only other thing I've got is uh, Western PA, Western Pennsylvania sectional happened this last weekend, and there weren't a lot of. Big name guys, uh, like Bill Drummond won open there. Um, Rob Epifania won limited. And then uh, CO, nice. um, Matt Hempel won CO. And then our little Danish buddy, uh, Magnus Krohn. Man, I forget. I think we've talked to him about this. If it's Crone or Crone. I think it's Crone. It's got to be Crone. Uh, I'm gonna call him Crone. Um, he's our, our favorite holster he's maker. A, got eleventh. Yeah, and we had Leif there uh, at eleventh. Leif posted a video of a like a stage that he won, and he he burned that stage stage down. Um, you know what? The only thing like on practice score now, like everybody has like all these like there's like a blue bullet symbol. There's like a Actually, looks like Practical Shooting Training Group has a deal. How do we get it so that people can put the hit factor next to their name? Because that would be cool. Because then we can go, like, when we're doing our match announcements, like, when we're talking about matches, like, if they're, like, on the hit factor Discord, mm-hmm. and I would say, like, you have to – if you're not on the Discord, you can't have a hit factor logo next to your name. But, like, I don't, we need to figure out how to, they can do that. So then we know people on the Discord, like, matches that they're at, and we can just look through the – the results because we don't know their actual names right can you not just like we could, we, we could just make another right yeah most of them people can like post that. their match results so we can talk about how they did if we want to no i want to i want everybody to see it 
do you not just put whatever you I don't know how to do it. So if somebody's like a practice score person, I'm not computer literate, so I probably wouldn't be able to figure it out anyway. So I don't I don't know how to figure this out. I don't know how you, how like the logos are chosen. I don't know if the people do or not, but you pay a little bit to practice score for that feature. I just don't know if you pick your logo or if the logos are like in a library. Well, Jeff's making all sorts of money on this thing, so let's put it to something. Yeah, we need to do another hat run. We got about yeah, enough we, money to we pay need for to do a hat hats, run. Yeah, we need to do hats because we can sell those. Um, that's on me a bit. Uh, I have a logo. I, I have a hat idea that I want to do, and maybe I just need to make it even simpler than what I was, what I was wanting. Uh, and we'll do it. Yeah, we need to do that. So, um, okay. Um, and before we shut it off, um, let's talk about Shooter's Connection real quick. You guys all know who Shooter's Connection is. They sponsor uh, a lot of matches in this sport. Um, Shooter's Connection is sponsoring today's episode of the podcast. So thank you, Shooter's Connection. Shooter's Connection is uh, run by competitive shooters, and um, they sponsor over 100 matches, is what I've been told. They sponsor over 100 matches in this sport every year. They're shipping stuff out fast. They ship my thumb safety, even though I bought the wrong one. They shipped it very fast, and I got it in time to fit and shoot a match before uh, before it came around. Their shipping is and very worked, fast, despite my greatest efforts to ruin uh, to ruin that thumb safety. But yeah, so thank you, Shooters Connection, for sponsoring the show and getting me my thumb safety. Um, if you guys want to support the show and please support Shooters Connection and thank them for uh, what they do for the sport what they've done for us by uh, hitting the link in the bio or in the description and checking them out. Appreciate it. And anything else from you goons? Uh, like, comment, subscribe, and we will try to respond to everything that we can. Fair enough. Oh, stop recording, damn it.